Okay, let's take a look at some of these Newton's second law problems. I believe this is page five. So when we're stating Newton's second law of motion, like it says, th it is an acceleration of an object, or an acceleration of an object depends directly upon the net force. The net force is key there. We'll get back to that in a second. Um, but it depends directly on that net force acting upon the object and inversely upon the object's mass. So it's kind of weird to think of inversely upon the object's mass. Well, let's take a look at it as a formula. And if I'm going too fast here, you can always slow the video down. And if it's not fast enough, you can always always speed it up. Um, so we know that a net force is equal to a mass times an acceleration. So the reason that we would say that uh, force is directly dependent upon the net, f or sorry, the uh, acceleration is directly upon the net force is because if we increase my acceleration here, what's going to end up happening is my force will increase over here, assuming that I'm keeping my mass the same. And that's the whole purpose of that first part of the lab that we did a few classes back. Um, now, this whole part about inversely upon the object's mass, so the acceleration depending inversely upon an object's mass, is if I have the same equation here, and instead of increasing my force and in causing my acceleration to increase, what I'm going to look at now is what happens if I were to increase my mass. It would make sense that if I'm increasing the amount of mass that an object has, assuming that I'm keeping the force the same, my acceleration is going to have to decrease. Think about it um, in terms of sort of common sense everyday type experiences, if something's heavier, if it's harder to, it, it's going to be harder to move. So in other words, if we have a whole lot of mass inside of an object, add more and more and more molecules to make it um, heavier and heavier and heavier, then it's going to be harder to move, which in other words would make my acceleration decrease, assuming I keep the force constant. That was the whole purpose of part two on the lab that we did the other day, the cart lab. So when we're looking at weight, there's a couple equations that we can use. We can either use W equals mg like I have written out here, or since weight is a force due to gravity, we can use our force formula, F equals ma. Force of gravity is equal to whatever the object's mass is times the acceleration from gravity. That's the same thing as W equals mg. The g in our mass times gravity formula, well that gravity produces an acceleration. So rather than using a whole new formula, I can just use Fg equals Ma. I end up getting the same thing still because my mass is still 75 kilograms. My acceleration is going to be negative 9.8 because gravity is pulling down. Oops, sorry, negative 9.8, not 0.98. But gravity is pulling me down at 9.8 meters per second squared. That down that negative represents the downwards direction, so we'd end up with a force of gravity equals 75 times negative 9.8. And 75 times negative 9.8 would be negative 735 newtons, which is weird, because why would we say that weight is 735 newtons? We wouldn't say negative, but we come out with it negative ma negatively mathematically. So if I have an object, that object's force, when pulled down by gravity, is, is in the negative direction, the downwards direction. What a scale is measuring is how much it has to push back in that direction. So really, when we refer to weight, it's not actually that it's the, the force of gravity that's pulling my mass down at a, at a negative rate. While that's true, we're actually measuring the positive version of that because the scale measures in the upwards direction how much force it has to push back with. So that's why we'd end up with positive 735 newtons. And if we went with the weight equation, we would drop the, the negative there. All right, let's take a look at number three. So it is possible that your numbers are going to look different from mine. And I'll explain why that is in a moment. So let's take a look at the scenario. We're going from standing on two feet to standing on one foot, and we want to figure out how much does the pressure in that one foot change. We're going to try to solve this mathematically. Um, like it says, we could use word explanations or picture explanations, but we really want to focus as much as possible on mathematical equations. The hardest thing about this unit 
because a lot of students will say, well, it's kind of common sense. I push something and something moves. And that's true, but now in this unit, really what we're trying to do is we're, we're picking numbers and we're putting numbers to things that may seem like they're common sense scenarios. And it's really hard to, to try to figure out a way to put numbers to something that you may feel is common sense. So that's pretty difficult in this unit, the biggest challenge. So if we're trying to figure out how much pressure changes on one foot, um, and pressure we're not going to totally get into, but this is going to be more of a, a thought question because pressure is a whole other concept aside from aside from force. But let's say if I have somebody that's standing on two feet, they're going to have a certain amount of pressure on the ground, but if they pick one of those feet up, like I have drawn over here, my horrible drawing of a person with their foot picked up, um, they're going to have twice as much weight on that one foot. So there's going to be twice as much pressure than if they're, we're standing on two feet. Um, mathematically, force is not the same as pressure, but we're going to kind of use it just to, to model pressure in this case. Really what pressure is is force divided by um, an area. So let's say I've got a person that weighs 100 kilograms. We know gravity is pulling them down at 9.8 meters per second squared. That person would weigh 980 newtons. Now, if the person were standing on two feet, if they weigh 980 newtons, then that means that they're going to have 490 newtons of force on one foot and 490 on the other, equating to a total of 980. Now, if that person is 980 newtons, and they're standing on one foot, all 980 of those newtons are acting on that one foot. So how much does the pressure change? It, it doubles, it increases, right? From 490 newtons per foot to now 980 newtons per foot. The other foot doesn't have any force acting on it at all, or what they say in this problem is pressure, which is a little bit of a different story, which we'll get into another time. All right, so number four doesn't give us any numbers, which is really difficult to solve this problem if, we, if we're not given any numbers. So let's see how to attack a problem like this. It says, if, if we want to double the acceleration on an object, what do we have to do to its force? All right, so anytime we see one of these problems where we have like these hypothetical questions where we have if, um, anytime we see a relationship like double or triple or cut in half or quadruple, um, reduced to one fourth, all those are pretty good indicators that we're going to set up two formulas to solve for what's happening. All right, so again, a couple key words here. If, double, the acceleration of an object, what do you need? Right, that's another good indicator that we're going to do a problem like the one that we're going to do here. So if we want to double the acceleration of an object, what do we need to do for the force? All right, so we know that we're dealing with forces. We know that we're dealing with acceleration. So the formula that relates those together is F equals MA. All right, so... If I try to solve directly and just use one formula, F equals MA, I'm going to run into some problems here. Because what I'm going to end up seeing is the only thing that I have, the only thing that's even semi a number is double. And really even that doesn't tell me much. So right now I don't have any force, any mass, or any acceleration, but I'm still going to use this formula, which is hard. So how is that possible that we can do that then without all these other numbers? Well we can make some numbers up, which I know sounds really strange, but as long as we make some numbers up here that are easy and manageable for us to deal with, you could use something else, like fractions or decimals, but it makes sense to just sort of pick nice, easy numbers to multiply and divide. Well, as long as we follow the relationship here and set up a second equation, we can look at these two equations in relation to one another and see what happens to a force, a mass, and acceleration anytime we're using this formula for any of those kind of problems. So if we want to double the acceleration, so what I did here is I'm using the force equation because again, it it relates F, M, and A for me. I'm doing the same thing over here, but I'm doing a before and after scenario. So this is like before I were to double the acceleration, and this would be like after I double the acceleration, what happens? So I can pick some numbers. It doesn't tell me anything about my mass, but what I'm going to be doing is dividing one of these equations by the other one anyway. So when I pick a mass, 
and I divide it by itself, it's it's not gonna it's not gonna give us anything. So we can pick any mass that we want. Doesn't tell me in the problem to increase or decrease my mass. So I'm gonna assume if this was an experiment that I was doing, I'm not gonna change the object that I'm experimenting with. So it makes sense that its mass would stay the same. So this would be like before I double the acceleration. This would be after I double the acceleration. The mass is still the same for that object. Then it asks me, I want to double the acceleration. What do I have to do to the force? Well, I'm going to double my acceleration. So I'm going to pick any number here. I chose two. You could go with literally whatever number you want. Keep it reasonable. And then as long as I follow this, I'm in good shape. So I'm going to take my two and I'm going to double it, which is why I have four over there. You could have started with two million here and four million over here. You could have started with 0.5 and, and 1.0 over here. Um, but we just want to stick with numbers that are nice and easy to deal with. So then it asks me, what do I need to do the force? Well, now I've got m times a, so I can find f, which is 100 times 2, which would be 200 newtons, which is weird because this number doesn't mean anything to me by itself. It's not until I get to the other side that it actually does. So then, doubled my acceleration, 4. 100 times 4 gives me... 400. It's weird as this number doesn't tell me anything. So you may be thinking, well, why did we do this if this number doesn't tell me anything and this number doesn't tell me anything? Because it's the comparison between the two that matters. You know, what what do we need to do for the force? Well, if I go from a force of 200 to a force of 400, it means that I'm doubling my force. So how to finish off the problem? This again not being an answer and this not again uh, being an answer. What we want to do is look at the relationship between the two of them. So in order to do that, we would say, is this an increasing or a decreasing relationship? So it looks like it's increasing. So then we would take the larger number divided by the smaller number every single time. If I, if I went from this side to this side, it would be a, de um, a decrease. But in this case, we're looking at it from 200 up to 400. So it's an increase, 400 divided by 200 is an increase of two, or we could say it's it's doubles. So there's a whole bunch of ways that we could say this. We would just say it's an increase of two, it's a two-fold difference. We would have to double the force, um, increase the force by two times, or by a factor of two, a whole bunch of ways we could say that as long as we're getting the point across that we'd need, we'd need to double the force somehow to double the acceleration. And that should make sense in relation to real life. If I push something twice as hard, it should speed up twice as fast, assuming that it's the same object. So if you pick different numbers here, you're going to get different numbers down here, but you're still going to come out with the same same sort of relationship. Because what if I change this to 4, and I change this number to 8 over here? Then I would end up going from 400 to 800, but it would still be that same relationship. It doubles going from 400 to 800, it's an increase. 800 divided by 400 is 2. So it's still an increase of, of 2 times. So this can be a little bit of a challenge, but it's really valuable to be able to set up a couple of equations and try to solve um, something based on, those, based on those equations that you've set up. 5 and 6 are very similar. The only difference is now we're tripling the force on an object. We want to figure out what happens to its acceleration. Now we know that we're relating a force, a mass, and acceleration, so we're going to use F equals MA. Um, we know that we're tripling the force on an object, so we have to use two equations because one of them is going to represent the force that's been tripled. One of them is going to represent the original force. So here's my two equations, F equals MA. I'm picking any random force, so in this case, one, if you're not sure what to pick, one's a great number to go with because it's really easy to triple one. Um, so that's why I put a three over here. But again, you could have just gone as easily gone from 25 to 75, 20 to 60, um, a whole bunch of a whole bunch of different things as long as you're showing that you're you're tripling, right? Um, and then we're going to assume that it's an object here. Well, an object's going to be the same whether or not I put a little bit of force into it, a whole bunch of force into it. We're assuming that we're experimenting with the, the same object. So I'm going to pick a mass, and I'm going to stick with that mass. In this case, I picked one. But again, you could have picked 
anything you wanted 1.75 and 1.75 weird number but that would work too even so I would uh, encourage you to pick some different numbers than me just to see if that relationship does work don't trust me don't take my word for it but actually you know take a look at it on your own so we want to know what happens to the acceleration well it makes sense that if I increase my force I should see an increase in acceleration so let's see if that is the relationship that takes place here I'm going from one meter per second squared to three meters per second squared so it looks like I am increasing my acceleration and I'm increasing it by a factor of threefold so three divided by one gives me that three times the amount of acceleration if I triple the force question six very similar um, although it does give you a number to start off with which tends to throw a lot of people and there's actually multiple different ways that you could do this particular problem so if a car can accelerate at two meters per second squared what acceleration can it attain if it's towing another car of equal mass this right here another car of equal mass tells me quite a bit it means that I'm going to be doubling my mass right because one car it's my beautiful drawing of a car there we could say that maybe it weighs a thousand kilograms well if I'm towing another car of equal mass we're assuming that other car isn't working otherwise it wouldn't be being towed just for the heck of it well if it's the same car it's also gonna weigh a thousand kilograms so now we got two cars that are sort of tied together here hitched together here one towing the other but now it's got to tow 2,000 that engine 2,000 kilograms of weight rather than just 1,000 that it by itself would would be and again you could use different numbers here it doesn't have to be a thousand you could use one in one it wouldn't be as realistic but that would be would be fine it still get the uh, the math across so we know that we are going to be relating acceleration um, mass and force so we're going to use f equals ma to do that um, the first way to solve this problem we could say well I know my acceleration so I'm going to use the actual acceleration that they give me here and that's totally fine we're going to make up our mass and we're going to see what our force is based on that so it's a force of 2000 newtons in my little situation here when we know that the force of an engine it's not just gonna it's not gonna randomly increase or decrease based on how much mass I'm, I'm pulling we're gonna assume that the engine here is maxed out on the amount of force it can give so if it's the same car whether or not it's just driving on its own or it's towing another car it's still going to be able to put out the same amount of force so we're gonna assume if we solve for 2,000 newtons here we got to start with 2,000 over here mass of two cars we already figured out because we got, went with 1,000 kilograms over here we have to go with 2,000 kilograms here because again it's pulling a car of equal mass so it's doubled its own mass and now we're solving for an acceleration we got a force uh, we got a mass times an acceleration well, how do I get a by itself divide by 2,000 if I did it to one side do it to the other I end up with a equals one meter per second squared so in other words it's it's now going to have an acceleration of one meters per second squared if I double its mass. Other way that we could have done this, all right? And I'm actually going to write it down here because I'm running out of uh, running out of room up there. But we could do this a second time around and say, you know what? Let's leave this till the very end. So if a car can accelerate at this many meters per second, what acceleration can it attain if it's towing another car of equal mass? forget about this and reference it in the very end let me show you what I mean so we know that we're going to be dealing with a before and after scenario so I'm going to set up two of my force equations if my car can accelerate at this what acceleration can it have after it's towing another car of equal mass so let's start with towing another car of equal mass let's pick a mass go with it towing another car of equal mass would mean whatever mass I picked here I have to double over here um, I don't know what the force is but again I can assume that the thing that's causing this car to drive forward whether or not it's driving on its own or pulling another car is its engine 
and that engine is not going to change the amount of force it can produce. So let's just pick a force that the car is going to be driving with and keep it the same. And then see what happens to my acceleration. So if I want to get A by itself over on this side, I need to divide by 2. Of course, algebra rules. If I do it to one side, I've got to do it to the other. So I end up with A equals 5. Doesn't tell me a whole lot quite yet. Let's go on the other side, get A by itself. Well, in this case, divide by, oops, divide by 1, not A. 10 divided by 1 here doesn't change anything. This cancels. We're left with A equals 10. So how can I say that we can leave this 2 meters per second to the end? Well, it's because it's just like any other problem here where I look at this and I say well, my acceleration, it looks like it decreases. Going from this side to this side is a decrease of 2 times. So it goes down 2 times, or in other words, gets cut in half. Well, now if I look at what the car can accelerate it to begin with was 2 meters per second squared, and my math is telling me that I have to cut it in half if I double the mass, which is what I'm doing if I'm adding another car, well, cutting any acceleration in half would work out here. It happens that the acceleration that I have to begin with is 2 meters per second squared, so I cut that in half, and I'm going to get 1 meter per second squared. So this way might be a little bit more of a roundabout way about doing things, but it may make more sense depending on who you are. So you got a couple of, couple of different ways to solve that. Right? Either way, you end up with 1 meter per second squared. And then 7 is actually kind of easy compared to all the rest of these problems that we've been doing because it gives me some numbers. I don't have to make them up. I don't have to look for any funky relationships. It's just done. So we got a student that gets fed up with physics, checks a physics textbook. Um, we know that a textbook weighs 15 newtons or has a force of 15 newtons. We know that it accelerates at 12.5 meters per second squared, so we can figure out what the mass is. And so the textbook weighs 15 newtons. Well, that would be if it were sitting on, a, sitting on the ground or sitting on the desk. The reason that I can say it weighs 15 newtons is because weight, remember, is from the force of gravity. So the force of gravity equals 15 newtons. So that's what I'm doing over here. I'm plugging in 15 newtons, which is the force of gravity into force. I don't know the mass of my textbook. That's the whole purpose of doing this uh, particular problem. And we do know the acceleration that a student is throwing this at is 12.5 meters per second squared. That'll get m by itself. If it's multiplied by 12.5 here, it's got to be divided by it. If I do it to one side, I've got to do it to the other. And I'm left with mass equals 1.2 kilograms here. All right. All right, so that is page 5. hope that helped make sense of things a little bit more. I'll take a look at page 6 next.